Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pete Sauer, and I'm happy to welcome you to a TCIPG seminar. This is Friday, the 2nd of March, and we do these things once a month, typically the first Friday of every month at 1 p.m. Central Time from beautiful Urbana, Illinois. And today, I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker, a guest, but then again, she's an alum from our department, so I have known her for quite a few years. Melanie Johnson came to us from Texas and got her master's degree in electrical engineering at the U of I in our electric power group. She works for the US Army Corps of Engineers, and officially it's called CERL, <coughs> Construction Engineering Research Lab. There's a little known fact that when I was a graduate student at Purdue, I did some consulting work for Searle. This would have been 1976. And it was in the development of PowerFlow software for a lady named Janet Spoonamore, who I'm not sure is there anymore. But I consider myself an ex Searle employee because of that. <laughs> but then I came here, of course, uh, at the University of Illinois to do electrical engineering and power. Melanie is going to talk about microgrids, fixed installations, security, and economics. And she is one of a very few number of electrical engineers at Searle in their energy group. And I'm not going to take up any more of her time. Let me just introduce Melanie Johnson. Thanks, Dr. Sauer, uh, for the introduction. Um, just a quick overview of what Searle is and, and where we are. Um, OK, there we go. Um, uh, CERL is the Construction Engineering Research Laboratory. We're part of a larger Corps of Engineers uh, research laboratory system called the Engineer Research and Development Center. So to give you an idea of where we fit in all of this, uh, we sit under the Corps of Engineers, is our major command in the Army. So that makes us a little separate from the research laboratories of RDECOM that you may be familiar with. Uh, we do focus largely on infrastructure work and how to support our installations in the United States, as well as our installations overseas. So to start out, I, I want to give you a definition of a microgrid that I'll, I'll use for the rest of the afternoon. And that is an islandable dynamic power distribution system capable of optimizing multiple power generation assets of lots of different varieties and multiple different loads of many varieties. And we do this optimization and control through uh, advanced control systems and through communication that goes two ways throughout the microgrid. Uh, for our definition, I want you to keep in mind that a microgrid should have two modes, a grid-tied mode where it is supported by a commercial utility, and then also an islanded mode where it is insular and, and can support itself for an extended period of time. And that period of time will vary, of course, with the microgrid's mission. Uh, we use advanced control systems to maintain system stability, to do economic optimization around many multiple cost objectives that can just depend on what your target is, and to supply graceful degradation of the power system should things not go according to plan. Um, all of these control techniques are focused on adjusting for the reduced inertia of the microgrid system. And finally, we would like it to be dynamically reconfigurable so that we can adjust to changing needs on our installations. Now, I, I think a big question might be, why is the Army interested in microgrids? And really, our interest in microgrids are driven by a number of pieces of policy uh, that give us different objectives. Some of these objectives inclu include uh, additional renewables penetration at our installations. So we want to have more renewable energy resources available for our installations to use, coupled with a requirement that we improve our energy security. Now, there's a lot of different ways to interpret energy security. I tend to think of it as improved reliability of our electrical power. Um, 
So all of these pieces of policy drive us towards a microgrid that will allow us to not only incorporate high penetrations of renewable energy, but use those resources when the commercial grid is not available, which is not generally the case with most of our renewable energy systems right now. They comply with all the standards that you're familiar with uh, that require them to trip offline when the commercial utility goes down. So that renewables integration uh, allows us to have this islanded operation and extend our fuel supplies throughout an extended period of time. It also allows us to make economic choices about what resources to use when, uh, and that can be in both grid-tied mode and in islanded mode. These systems can also provide us a conduit to, to participate in evolving energy markets. So you may be familiar with some of the markets that are in the United States in California, on the East Coast, in Texas. Uh, one thing that we think we can do with these systems, if we're already installing the advanced controls, if we're already uh, giving ourselves this additional capability, we should use that to try to generate a business case or support the grid and be a good grid citizen, as I, I tend to think of it. So just to give you an idea of how much policy has been developed in the Army governing energy, this is a, a plot that shows you some important pieces and shows you a few of the key requirements that have happened. And you can see that since 2006, policy has really exploded as we've had uh, extended operations and uh, energy prices have gone up. So another facet of microgrids in the DOD and the Army is the scalability of these microgrids. There, I tend to look at it as three different spaces. One of them is a tactical microgrid. This is a very highly portable system. Uh, people in the field can pick it up, take it with them. It supplies their electricity needs. And this system is generally always islanded. These are small and characterized by their portability. As we go up uh, one step, we get to operational microgrids. These are our forward operating bases. Maybe there are, are 100 people, a couple hundred people supported by these microgrids. And, and they may have the opportunity, although it would be rare, to interface with a in-country grid. Uh, and finally, most of my work and, and a lot of our work at Searle focuses on the installation. So these are really our large domestic army uh, forts or bases. And they're usually connected to the grid. In fact, right now, their power needs are almost entirely met by commercial utility supplies. There are exceptions to that, but in general, that's true. So these are only islanded in contingency situations when something uh, isn't working correctly with the commercial utility. Uh, these installations also tend to be quite large. Their loads tend to be tens of megawatts. Some of the largest are, are up to 100 megawatts. So these are not small systems. And what we really our objective, I think, here is to have a flexible distribution system that allows us to do this dynamic reconfigurability and adjust for uh, changing conditions and mission needs. So just to give you a, a cartoony picture of, of what we envision our microgrids being, of course, we have our renewable energy resources, our energy storage. Uh, we incorporate fossil fuel generation that we already have, or if there is a central plant, that could be a good member of a microgrid. And of course, supplies from the grid. All of this interfaces with a, a microgrid control and optimization system, uh, transfers power and data to our loads. Uh, on the bottom, you'll see that we have uh, mission critical loads and mission priority loads. Uh, critical mission loads need to be served all the time. They're essential to our operations, to the mission of the installation. So those need to be 100% met by our microgrid. Uh, priority loads are the ones that we can shed if resources are scarce. I include electrified non-tactical vehicles. That's what NTV is. Uh, because at several of our microgrids, we are working to incorporate these. The, the theory being that these can provide a useful energy storage resource as well as be transportation on the installations. So if we we will buy vehicles, and if we can buy vehicles that can support our microgrids, it's a, an additional way to use them. When we look at establishing a microgrid at an installation, there are really several phases that we, we need to look at. The first of these is looking at an energy security assessment of the installation. These generally identify the critical mission loads, the critical infrastructure that support those loads, and if there's any risks to that infrastructure, the mitigations that will correct those risks. Once we have those critical portions of our installation identified, 
we can look at developing an island. So basically like looking at that critical infrastructure and determining what subset makes a reasonable island based on its existing uh, distribution system and what, what upgrades or changes or modifications would be needed to make that happen. The other portion of developing an islanding plan is determining what generation assets will support that island. There may be backup diesel generators already there that we can use, or renewable resources, or we may need to install uh, new systems. Finally, with those two things in place, we can look at microgrid implementation. So implementing those upgrades, installing the generation, and establishing our microgrid. Now, of course, this is how we would like to implement it. It doesn't always happen this way, but this is the ideal case. So microgrids in, in the DoD and Army are uh, experience a number of challenges. First of all, we have uh, a huge variety of systems that have to be integrated into one uh, operational system that cooperates and exchanges data and communicates and, and has this element of cooperation. And that's particularly challenging when we start looking at interconnecting existing tools that may use proprietary protocols or tools. We have legacy equipment, legacy generators that may not be uh, capable of cooperating with the control system that need to be modified. And of course, as you interconnect all of these systems, you can introduce new vulnerabilities to the critical infrastructure. There are a number of standards and, and work that's being done uh, that try to mitigate these challenges. Uh, NIST and the uh, Smart Grid Interoperability Panel are continually working towards more standards on how these things should interact. Um, from an from a acquisition perspective, DHS and Idaho National Lab have put together some procurement language that can help with the acquisition of the communication systems that make all this possible. And there are several published roadmaps, uh, some from DOE, some from other places, on how to make all this happen. Uh, one of the other major challenges that we see is overlaying network communication with our critical infrastructure and the challenges that this poses to information assurance and cybersecurity. The communication that's required for these control systems to work is extensive. We need to be able to share data regarding energy production and usage, pricing data. In some cases, even, even the system electrical protection can rely on the communication system. And any one of these things may not seem that threatening, but in the wrong hands, a lot could be concluded about our operations if a big picture was able to be drawn. So we need to protect not only the control functions of the system, but also just that observability of, of the microgrid. The uh, network connectivity, of course, we may have to interface this with our installation's uh, existing communication network in order to achieve uh, communication back to a command center or to give the garrison some control over what the microgrid is doing. And in some cases, we may even establish a connection to the internet. All of these introduce new vulnerabilities to our existing systems, including any existing SCADA that we may have. And as we introduce more sophisticated control devices, exposing them to risks from outside is, of course, uh, a daunting uh, proposition for, for a military installation. So I think a lot of the challenges that we see between integrating uh, communication systems and IT systems and power systems really arise from a, a cultural difference. Um, in information technology world, equipment refresh happens often. Weekly patching is, is not a problem. There are good times to conduct virus scans when no one is, is doing work. Uh, you have an implicit assumption that if the failure mode should be to deny access. In power systems world, we may refresh our equipment every 20 years, maybe. It may not be that frequently. We have to be up 100% of the time. There's no good time to reboot, no good time to patch. Uh, there's no good time to slow the system down to run a virus scanner. And our implicit assumption has to be allow. If, if things are not going properly, someone has to be able to log into the system and fix it. There's also this difference between how we rate the criticality of the system. In a power system, availability is key. After that, integrity and confidentiality. And it's the op sort of, uh, almost a complete opposite in information technology world. And finally, in power systems world, things are run by the operations department, not the IT department. And they have very different philosophies. So 
reconciling these two paradigms becomes very challenging, uh, particularly on a military installation where the DPW, Department of Public Works, and the Network Enterprise Center uh, are very, very separate entities. The, the challenges continue when we talk about operational capabilities at our installations. Uh, a lot of security measures that are, are very standard and useful in protecting an IT system can cause some serious challenges in a contingency situation. Uh, we all have, I'm sure, read about Stuxnet and, and the challenges, and, and the example here is just calling out a response from Siemens after Stuxnet that, you know, what is their most, their highest priority in their response? Assuring their customers that their plant operations will not be affected by the solution. So when we introduce security measures, we try to have long passwords, robust passwords. We try to have um, role-based authentication. We introduce a problem for people trying to fix the system in a, in a, in a contingency. Uh, it won't be as easy for them to just log in and do what they need to do at 3 o'clock in the morning or 4 o'clock in the morning. Um, but it will be more secure from a information perspective. So again, reconciling this, this paradigm difference in paradigms between the two is, is challenging. So I think a real question, perhaps, is why would we connect these systems to the internet? Why, why would we put ourselves through this? And I think that there are several answers. And the most important of these has to do with generating a business case or economic uh, drivers for these systems. <coughs> If we allow the microgrid to communicate with the installation's utility, with the independent system operator, with the regional transmission operator, it opens the door for the microgrid to be a part of whatever energy market is available. And our installations are pretty familiar with the concept of peak shaving. So when I, I talk about this, I, I'm not just talking about peak shaving. I'm talking about being a real energy market participant. The second piece of this is that funding for large-scale microgrid projects is scarce. It's, it's unlikely that we will have the funding available to go out and build a microgrid at our installations. And so we need to develop alternative means of financing these systems. And that will probably tend to take the form of a power purchase agreement with a, a third party who would build us a microgrid and sell us electricity conditioned by that microgrid. You could think of it that way. And that, that electricity being conditioned by the microgrid should be of an increased reliability than what is from the utility. So uh, a big question, I think, we all, uh, at least in, in the Army and DOD, is, is what is that additional reliability worth? And it's, it's a, a topic of much debate and scrutiny. <laughs> uh, so finally, introducing these new vul vulnerabilities can largely eliminate all of these benefits of having a microgrid. If it's less secure because it can be attacked from the internet, then we haven't really gained any additional reliability. So providing, providing a layered defense is critical for realizing both the immediate and the extended benefits of the microgrid. Just to talk about the economics op and opportunities that we have with microgrids, uh, I mentioned peak shaving, uh, which basically is just reducing our demand inside our fence line to save us some money. Uh, demand response would be doing almost the same thing, but in response to grid pricing. Energy arbitrage is, of course, buying low and selling high. And finally, if we have the capability to operate our resources very quickly through uh, the control system, then we can actually act as a grid resource for regulation and spinning reserve. And we can use these to start to develop that business case that could uh, lead to the power purchase agreement. Uh, this graphic, it only sort of shows half of the United States, and I'm sorry about that, but it was done for a study where we only cared about the western half of the United States. So, as you can see, a number of our installations do fall in California ISO. We have a couple in ERCOT. Um, Interestingly, Fort Bliss, one of our, our largest installations, is not in ERCOT, which is a little uh, almost unfortunate. Um, and you'll notice that Fort Carson, where, which we'll talk about in a lot of detail in just a few slides, is not in an energy market. They do have a vertically integrated utility. So 
When, when I look at a, a microgrid, a microgrid should have a, a set of capabilities, which you'll see listed in the uh, left column here. It can do prioritized load shedding. So based on some predetermined set of rules, these loads are higher priority than those. We talked about mission critical loads and we talked about priority loads. So it can shed loads based on criteria. It can intentionally island. It has advanced control over its resources. It can turn them on and off. It can change how much input or how much generation it's producing. Uh, it can communicate with all of these resources. It integrates a large amount of renewables in some cases. It will likely have an energy storage component and it should have internal generation. So this is just to try to pair these capabilities with the economic function that they can have. So we can have peak shaving through all of these, we can do demand response, energy arbitrage, perform ancillary services, and participate in real-time pricing plans if we have the communication and control to do so. And just to take a, a look at some of our installations, as I mentioned, Fort Carson is stuck in a vertically integrated utility with lots of capacity and very little congestion or, or constraints. Uh, Fort Bliss experiences some capacity constraints in the summer, but are largely in a vertically integrated utility. Fort Irwin, on the other hand, is in California ISO and, and served by a fairly progressive utility. So they have a lot of opportunity to perform these services. And uh, we'll talk about a project that may be taking advantage of those in just a, a little bit. Uh, the same study that we looked at the Western United States and where their markets fall, this is a, we'll call it a simulator or a calculator that shows the potential for performing demand response at Fort Irwin. There are several, several oh, we'll point out that the benefits could be great, given that in a single day you could earn quite an amount of money by just, just turning things off at Fort Irwin. Uh, the trick is there are uh, several caveats to that calculation. Uh, the baseline calculation is actually Fort Irwin's real load. It is not the last 45 non-event days. Uh, in the simulator, if Fort Irwin makes a bid, it is accepted. And there is no non-performance penalty. In fact, in this simulator, Fort Irwin always performs. Uh, the non-critical is that the installation are, are estimated based on a lot of data, but they're still estimated. And we're not uh, including any service fees that Fort Irwin would experience using an aggregator. So with those caveats in mind, you can see that maybe this is a, a very optimistic simulation, but the, uh, the potential here is, is quite great if we are able to build in these capabilities. Uh, some of the additional challenges for installations trying to participate in energy markets include uh, the need for third-party aggregators to assume risks of market participation. Basically, our installations are not allowed to assume those risks. They can't participate in a system where they might lose money. So if they were not to perform after making a bid and having it be accepted, that's a problem. Uh, this simulator work actually is has led to a, a an energy security technology certification program project, ESTCP, to demonstrate an open uh, automated demand response protocol at Fort Irwin uh, with, in partnership with Honeywell. So it'll be interesting to see what the real results actually are over the next couple of years. So I'm, I'm going to transition into talking about some of the microgrid projects that uh, we have ongoing and are involved with at Searle. The first of these is the Smart Power Infrastructure Demonstration for Energy Reliability and Security. It's a, a very long acronym, but uh, the logo's cute. <laughs> Are those are good spiders. They're protecting our power grid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, keeping the bugs away. So there, spiders is what we call a JCTD. It's a Joint Capability Technology Demonstration. These projects are run by the Office of the Secretary of Defense from the Rapid Fielding Directorate. I know that's a lot of organizations and names, but. Uh, that's where the project sort of comes from. It has many multiple objectives. The first and foremost of these to be develop a cybersecurity solution for microgrid technology at our installations through layered in-depth defense and improved information assurance. Spiders will also overlay smart grid technologies and applications into the microgrid. And really, these are just all those control and communication functions that, that we all think of as being part of a microgrid, two-way communication, load shedding, automated load balancing, uh, 
demand side management through prioritized load shedding. All of those capabilities would fall under the, the smart grid objectives of spiders. Spiders must also provide microgrids that are capable of islanding from their commercial utility. In our final phase, we will island an entire installation under a microgrid. The, the first two demonstrations are portions of, a, of an installation. Uh, there are goals to extend our, our continuity of, ins of operations. So basically, the power goes down. We want to make sure that we can operate longer than we could before based on our existing backup diesel generation. So if with our existing diesels and fuel tanks, we could run for three days with a microgrid, we need to be able to run for longer. And the seamless disconnect and reconnect from the grid. Although there are other challenges to that, uh, backfeeding the utility is is never something uh, that utilities are a fan of. So most of the, the first two demonstrations of spiders will actually be break before make, uh, as far as the microgrid goes. Uh, and then the, the final objective here is to incorporate distributed and intermittent renewable resources. So making those resources available off the grid and reducing our fossil fuel consumption and, and carbon bootprint through utilizing those resources when we are islanded from the utility and extending our, uh, the longevity of our microgrid through reduced fuel consumption. So when I say it's a joint capability technology demonstration, this is how joint it is. We have involvement from uh, Pacific Command, Northern Command, which are two of the major uh, Army and DOD commands. Uh, DOE is involved, DHS is involved, five national laboratories, um, the laboratory system I work with. Uh, we have four military services, local utilities, and the states of Colorado and Hawaii. So here's our, our program overview. In our first phase at Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam, this is Pearl Harbor in Hawaii on Oahu, uh, it's a circuit level demonstration. We've basically isolated one feeder, a couple of diesel generators, some renewable uh, energy assets that are existing, and we will hopefully incorporate some forms of energy storage to power a wastewater treatment plant. Uh, this wastewater treatment plant is sort of a simulated critical load. It does have components that are uh, required to operate 100% of the time. In fact, they require a UPS to make sure that this particular system stays operational when the power goes out. Uh, what's interesting about using the wastewater treatment plant is that the load is very dynamic. It changes with tides, it changes with water consumption and water usage, so it offers a, a, an interesting test case for the, the baseline control system. Phase two at Fort Carson. Uh, I should mention that uh, in, the, in the grand scheme of the JCTD, I am on the technical management team and I am primarily handling our efforts at Fort Carson. So at Fort Carson, we'll have large-scale renewables integration. We'll have vehicle-to-grid power for energy storage. Uh, we have smart microgrids. We're using actual critical assets identified by Fort Carson. And we'll hopefully do our demonstration in, in conjunction with a, a homeland defense demonstration and continuity of operations exercise. So this is sort of an overhead view of Fort Carson. Fort Carson is located in Colorado Springs, uh, Colorado. And that shaded area in, in Fort Carson, they call that the banana. And if, you, if I had the whole picture, you'd see that it actually sort of does look like a banana. But the, the green shaded region here in the middle is where we will form our microgrid. We are incorporating a two megawatt solar array that's located to the south. And in this case, we're actually incorporating more than one electrical feeder. Uh, depends on the final iteration of design exactly how many. So to give you a sense of the scale of the microgrid at Fort Carson, our critical loads, the ones that have to be served 100% of the time, are roughly 1.1 megawatts at peak. Our tier two loads, which are the priority loads that we can shed if needed due to resource scarcity, we have about one megawatt. And then we have some additional tier three loads which are considered non-critical that we can either power if it makes the integration problem uh, more simply solved, or we can leave them out of the islanded microgrid operation. Our generation assets include four diesel generators, which will provide us about 3.5 MVA uh, and a two megawatt solar array, as well as a couple of energy storage components. We have five Smith electric vehicles, which between all five have about 440 kilowatt hours of energy storage. 
And then we know based on our modeling and simulation that we will need additional energy storage to the tune of 500 to 700 kilowatts that can last us for about an hour. And that's primarily to integrate that massive solar array down to the south. Uh, moving on to phase three, Camp Smith, we're back out on Oahu. Uh, this will be the first military installation entirely islanded as a microgrid. Um, lots of the same technology demonstrations as Fort Carson, but to a, a, a larger extent. And just to give you an idea of where all this is, uh, the first phase, Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam, is down here, uh, located right on the, the harbor, and Camp Smith is up here on the hill. So there's, there's not much to say about Camp Smith yet. We're still sort of in the early design process and figuring out what resources we need. And finally, one of the interesting features of being a, a joint capability technology demonstration is the formal transition phase at the end. So by doing these three demonstrations, what we really hope to learn is how do we secure our microgrids from an information assurance and cybersecurity perspective? What, what are some best practices? What, are, what did we learn that doesn't apply? What did we try that didn't work? What did we try that did work? So we'll, we'll take all of these lessons learned and try to transition them both to uh, additional DOD sites through design guides and design templates, but also into the commercial sector, and that's part of uh, DOE's contribution to spiders is that commercial uh, trans, uh, transition. Yes. Commercialization, do you think, are going to go on? I mean, this is a sort of at particular components or something more system oriented? I think from a, for a commercial perspective, what we'll be seeing is, is hopefully the transition of the, the control strategies and, and the systems integration components, as well as trying to implement cybersecurity solutions, even for small commercial users. DOD is always going to be uh, much more concerned about that, I think, than uh, perhaps home users might be. But I think bringing these control systems and these systems to remote communities and um, isolated areas is, is kind of the objective. about the project is whether you think you will be basically incorporating best practices into the spider's installations or to what extent you will be inventing new things that need so so, so it's interesting to think about which direction all the transition is going to be going and so how do you think about that how much of the program will be inventing new things uh, or maybe it's just that they aren't new things, but you'll learn a lot of lessons when you try to do this, so that's what gets transferred out. I really think it's a, a bit of both. I think there are some technologies for microgrids that have a, a fairly high technology readiness level. They're, they're almost commercial, but they, they haven't made that leap into commercial technology, but perhaps through this demonstration we can bring them up a little closer to that. I think one of the, the key things to transition is a, a method for doing the systems integration problem. I think that's one of the, the biggest challenges that we have is, you know, we know how to run a power system, we know how to run an IT network, and we know how to run industrial controls. We need to sort of put them all together into one unified microgrid system, which I think is a little less clear on the, the specifics and, and, and that integration. Um, Another microgrid project that we have on, ongoing at CERL is uh, a field scale microgrid demonstration at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. This one's uh, somewhat smaller than the spiders microgrids, but it will still learn a lot. And some of the interesting technologies that I think that are coming out of this one are adjustable trip curve breakers and the microgrid interface switch for seamless transition from islanded to, uh, to excuse me, from grid tied to islanded mode and back to grid tied mode. Uh, it's interesting to think about the power systems prote protection issues that we have in a microgrid, right? We just disconnected from the utility. Suddenly our short circuit current values have changed, our load flow has changed, and that means our relay and coordination settings on our breakers are, are maybe they need to change too. So that's part of these adjustable trip curve breakers. And then that interface switch uh, for synchronizing back to the grid and, and making sure that we don't backfeed the grid with our generation is an interesting technology that is being developed. And this project is in part partnership with uh, Eaton Corporation. Uh, 
This next project, this one is, is, is tiny, but it's very interesting because it is doing local DC distribution. So basically, the company that we're working with on this one, Next Tech Power Systems, has developed uh, a DC distribution system for fluorescent lighting. So basically, you're able to eliminate one AC to DC conversion from every fluorescent light bulb. This is a great way to save uh, some energy to be a little more efficient. And it also is uh, extremely convenient for integrating PV and energy storage. So you can put your emergency lighting on the energy storage and have a, a very, very tiny uh, pseudo microgrid. We'll say pseudo because it doesn't really involve uh, fossil fuel generation. So that's a, an interesting one that I think has some applications as we advance microgrid technology and as we integrate more and more renewables onto our installations, it may make a lot more sense to use more electricity in DC. And just a, a couple other to a couple others to bring your awareness to, we have a, a microgrid demonstration at Fort Bliss in partnership with Lockheed Martin. Uh, here we're taking this dining facility, which you have a nice aerial view of. It has some existing solar here on the roof and surrounding it. Uh, it has a nice diesel generator over there. Um, and we're looking at making this a, an islandable system that uh, will run on a hierarchical control system. And so uh, just another approach to the controls. And it'll be interesting to see the results of that systems integration. And finally, I mentioned this uh, several slides back, but the open ADR protocol demonstration. Uh, what we were able to do is, through a, a partnership with Honeywell, is we're going to be demonstrating a system that is capable of responding to pricing and signals from uh, both Southern California Edison and California ISO under a pilot program they're running and a pilot tariff uh, and do automated demand response through some of Fort Irwin's uh, building automation and, and utility management systems. So they'll be interfacing with the, the Honeywell system. So that's an interesting um, precursor to integrating this into a microgrid. So there's no real microgrid component to that, but it is a, an essential capability to demonstrating microgrid economic capabilities. So I actually have reached the end of my slides. <laughs> uh, my, my final thoughts here are, our microgrids really do offer us uh, the potential of higher reliability and efficiency. Uh, by using our diesel generators at, a, at their most efficient levels, by integrating our renewable energy resources, uh, we can achieve some of these goals that we have outlined in policy and, and be better energy citizens. Uh, the control and communications that make it possible have a substantial, um, make it possible and substantial have uh, great capabilities to let us participate in market interaction and to develop business cases for our microgrids. And finally, overlaying the communication network on our critical infrastructure does introduce new vulnerabilities, but these are things that we have to uh, find solutions to in order to realize the many benefits that microgrid technology offers. So I think. That's it. Um. <laughs> I guess I can start here. And first of all, <clears throat> for the off-site people, I think the way to ask a question is to use the chat feature on this uh, system. But we have people here in Urbana lining up uh, to ask <laughs> questions for Melanie. Carl. I was wondering if you could break down the microgrid e economics um, argument a little bit more in detail for us. In particular, what does it cost to make something a microgrid? And also, I wasn't sure I understood, is there something about having a microgrid that is a profit thing? In other words, after you've got a microgrid, you can do something that makes money for you? I, I wasn't sure I understood that point. Um, so, <laughs> so I would say microgrids for the military are not really a question of Profit from from the from our perspective, it's really about generating additional energy reliability, right? We want to have we want to have kilowatt hours that are more reliable than what our utility supplies. <laughs> However, we need to figure out what value that does have for us in terms of dollar signs, because that helps us generate an idea of what we might pay additionally under a power purchase agreement for power conditioned to be more highly reliable by a microgrid. Okay, so 
using the microgrid controls and communication to participate in energy markets is a way for either that installation or whoever comes in and builds the microgrid and has the power purchase agreement to generate additional return on investment. So you might be able to do better demand response, for example. Yeah, that, that's one possibility. If we're able to, uh, if we have a large energy storage unit and we can use that to perform energy arbitrage, that's another uh, way to generate some, some income. You could also maybe use it to provide uh, ancillary services if it were big enough or if you had enough of them. Uh, and how much does it cost to make a make? <laughs> depends on the installation and, and how much modification you have to do. It varies widely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have one question from off campus. Uh, one of our participants wants to know what kind of control and protection automation systems are being used in these microgrids? Perhaps some more detail on the actual equipment being used. Um, unfortunately, I can't talk about too much, uh, particularly on the spiders program, specifically what we're implementing, because for one thing, uh, the first phase is uh, still in its design process, so there's there's not too much to share. And uh, beyond that, in phase two, we're we're still in a, a, a interesting stage of the project where we have to kind of keep what we know under wraps. I I think from from what I have seen, uh, a hierarchical control system is what we desire. We need something that allows us as I mentioned, to, to degrade gracefully when things don't go quite according to plan. So you want to have a central controller that maybe does economic optimization and, and uh, economic dispatch to use your resources as efficiently as possible. And whether efficiently as possible is in terms of cost or fuel consumption or carbon footprint, that's, that's something that you can optimize with that controller. And then you need to have distributed controllers that are capable of operating the equipment even without the presence of the central controller. So I think that's what we tend to look for in these systems. But uh, as far as specific equipment and control system details, I'm, I'm afraid I, I can't share. So I'm, I'm curious about what communications you envision between your uh, base microgrids and the utility that you connect to. And it seems that you could probably do something pretty minimal if you take care of all the generation optimization, demand management, and so forth. Uh, inside the fence, as you put it, and really just communicate very little back to the utility. And it, and it would seem that if you can kind of define a, a minimum information model between yourselves and outside the fence, as you put it, that that would go a long ways towards uh, security. Absolutely. I think one thing that I, I know is being looked at a lot with spiders is what, how do we characterize that communication so that we can restrict it to the basically what do they need to know and what we need to know so that we can do very good monitoring to determine if it, um, if some, something outside of those uh, parameters has, has been generated by somebody outside, you know, and a third party attack or something along those lines, sorry. Um, so yes, what I think what we envision as the communication is perhaps pricing data coming from the utility. Uh, if for some reason we need to disconnect or reconnect, communicating that to the utility just for their preparation. And then I think there's some interest in the microgrid doing its own sensing to determine if something is going wrong with the grid so that it could island preemptively. So I think those are probably the major kinds of communication. Um, Tom Overby from Electrical and Computer Engineering here at Illinois. You know, the term microgrid is one of these vague kind of terms that people define in, in all sorts of different ways. I understand as the military, you, you have certain mandates and, and, you know, you want to operate your bases for many months off grid. Um, in, in looking at your slides, a lot of what you're talking about was really load control, that you want to make the load more manageable so that you can match generation, prioritize your load. And I guess that's part of the microgrid concept, but it's also part of just making the load more controllable. Mm -hmm. And I, I think of an application where, you know, as a, a homeowner might have a backup generator and they've got so many circuits that are on that backup generator, but maybe they want to have more circuits on and make their load controllable. So a lot of your concepts here would apply mm -hmm. to backup generation. 
Absolutely. Um, so I think the whole idea of these microgrids kind of stems from a desire to use diesel backup generators more efficiently. Uh, in a lot of cases, they're very much oversized for the loads they serve, and that causes them to operate at very low efficiency points. So I, I think being able to selectively pick what loads they serve and make sure that those loads put them at a, an optimal uh, efficiency operating point. So most diesels actually are more efficient at their maximum operating outputs than, than at their low end. So if we can move them to that by either adding load that is not all that critical when we have low critical load demand and then, and then turning that off when we have high critical demand, that, that helps us use the diesel generators more efficiently. And you'll see a lot more of that on the, on the tactical microgrids and the, um, and the operational space microgrids. Yeah, so I guess my question you're kind of getting at it is a, lo a lot of the microgrid research is really load management research, mm -hmm. which could apply to a backup generator system, which, you know, I, I don't know if you'd call that a microgrid, but we might have trouble calling a microgrid, <laughs> or a, a, a standard uh, house or building connected to the existing power grid and you want to just make your load price sensitive so when the price goes so high we curtail certain loads so i guess the question is 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 a is a lot of the microgrid research really sort of load control research um i would say that the research i'm involved with is more demonstration targeted, demonstrating the technologies and, and learning what works and what doesn't work. As far as determining load control kinds of algorithms, I think that's certainly of interest and I think it's something that we investigate uh, by trying to determine what our critical and priority loads are and trying to do our load prioritization. Does that, does that make sense? I, I, I guess I've never kind of looked at it from a load control. Oh. Uh, Prosper Panumpabi uh, from ITI. I don't have uh, directly a question, but I have two observations on which uh, I would like you uh, to give some comment. Uh, the first one is uh, for military application. I like the idea of uh, portable power grid or power grid in boxes. <laughs> Uh, for such application, um, I see the best uh, uh, way of communication for uh, cyber security will be the wireless network, so which uh, consequently uh, increase the degree of uh, vulnerability. That was my first uh, observation. Uh, the second one is uh, when you produce uh, I will save electricity. Uh, we tend to to be more economical. Economical, you know. As you said, we have to look away to sell back to the grid, so we can make some money. Uh, uh, I like also the idea of uh, going back to the DC transmission system. <clears throat> Uh, here we have uh, some challenges, you know, with uh, going back to the DC transmission system. Like, you know, we have to have the DC breaker also and also. What challenges uh, do you have with uh, some experience you have had with uh, the DC uh, transmission uh, power grid? Okay. So, first question or the first comment uh, concerning wireless communication is, Wireless always seems like a great solution, but there's a lot of concern surrounding even very encrypted wireless communication for military operations. Uh, most places I've been to, it's like, no, just please, please put in fiber, Cat5, Cat6, no wireless. So it always seems like a great solution, and it would decrease the cost of a lot of these systems, but uh, the security of it is, uh, th there's less comfort with wireless systems. Uh, the middle comment, I, 
DC. DC. Okay. Uh, the DC systems I have been working with are extremely low voltage. So as far as having large DC EVIT transmission scale breakers, I, I haven't had a lot of experience with that. I, I see this as more of a, a very local application once I have a lot of renewables or energy storage uh, that you might be able to use like in a room like this to provide lighting or in an office to provide electricity directly to monitors, LED lighting, or laptops. So not too much exposure on the protection side. Uh, this is more of a comment than a question. Tarek Abdallah, U.S. Army, and building on your earlier observation, Professor, as far as how we're uh, planning on implementing best practices and lessons learned from these demonstrations, you'd notice that, you know, one thing I can offer is the structure and how this particular program, the SPIDERS JCTD, was structured is it's a three-phase program. So we're um, planning and are designing the program such that we can roll, roll into the you know, our findings and our lessons learned from the phase one into phase two, and from phase one and phase two into phase three as they sort of the full demonstration leveraging all of the R&D that was invested in the earlier phases. So I would offer that, and obviously in addition to everything that Melanie su suggested as far as transition, you know, and we, there's a transition management team associated with the program, so. Thank you, Tarek. That's Tarek Abdallah. He's one of my uh, colleagues at Searle, and he is very deeply involved with spiders as well, and is right now in the gory details of phase one at Joint Base Pearl Harbor Hickam. So thank you, Tarek, for pointing that out. I, I should have <laughs> covered that. Okay, we have a user online. Uh, how can companies that might have innovations or technologies useful in resolving the vul vulnerabilities you noted, particularly in terms of security, participate in future projects or appear on your radar? Um, so certainly for, for the SPIDERS program, people who have technology to offer, uh, keep an eye out. Uh, we did post, our, our, all, all of the contracting actions for SPIDERS will be on Federal Business Opportunities website. Uh, as far as bringing good ideas to us, Searle has a broad agency announcement where we're always accepting uh, white papers with idea summaries and, and we're always looking for good ideas. So that's uh, another thing that's available on the Searle website and everybody has my email address now so I can send you the info packet. <laughs> Howdy, Carl Reinhardt. Uh, what is the uh, total load of Fort Carson? Uh, I believe the peak summertime load at Fort Carson is about 35 megawatts. So at six megawatts, it's only a fraction of the total load. It's a very small piece of Fort Carson. And so they're just like critical access assets, brigade headquarters, critical services? Uh, I'm sorry? Brigade headquarters, division headquarters, critical services? I can't, I can't say what the assets are. I'm sorry. I mean for force protection reasons? Yes. I, I just I, I can't talk specifically about what the loads are other than they are critical base loads. Well, but a fraction of the total load. So it, is it, it totally excludes mm -hmm. all the people that live on Fort Carson, residing family quarters, et cetera. So so with the expansion okay, so I, I, I feel like I'm sensing what you're getting at, which is all the people in Fort Carson, we need to take care of their families and make sure that they're supported in a in a contingency situation as well. And I think that's certainly on our radar. Um, but I, I I would argue that we basically can't afford to build a power system of that scale um, right off the bat. So these, these things, I think they will evolve into even systems that could support local communities where other people stand, where the support to the installation lives as well. But we kind of have to crawl, walk, and then run. So shifting, by focusing on our, our critical loads, we can have great mission sustainment and be able to support our operations that are, are critical both here in the United States and overseas. Expanding that support to the rest of the installation, to people's homes and, and, and businesses, I think is uh, a desirable thing, but I think it will take us time to get there. So I noticed that there was very limited storage. So you know, your solar cells are only available nominally during the day. Mm -hmm. So you're, depending on the diesel to provide the load support outside of the... Uh... Yes. The, the diesel would be essentially the base load. Uh, the, the diesel will provide support for base loading and, and for uh, situations when any of their renewable or storage assets are not available. Um, of course, we would 
love to see these be um, greener assets, but the diesels are what we have right now. So in a lot of ways, some of the microgrids we're building now are trying to take advantage of existing assets, and those existing assets tend to be diesel generators. Um, there are, of course, air quality and permitting requirements that have to be considered and dealt with to use them for these applications, but uh, I think it could pave the way for natural gas generators to be used uh, if the technology and, and the benefits of microgrids are realized. Thank you. I suppose this is an easy question, if, if you can answer. Um, can you give me a, a feeling of the time scale uh, for which disconnected operation has to be sustained? I mean, is the, is the goal forever? Is it weeks? So is it days? There's some guidance and recommendations that came out uh, several years ago from the Defense Science Board that say Army installations should be able to sustain themselves in the event of a power outage for six months. For the purposes of spiders, our demonstrations will be 72 hours. And that uh, was deemed to be a number long enough to show that we can do it and short enough that we don't disrupt base operations uh, limitlessly. So. <laughs> OK, any other questions? I would also add that when I was in the Air Force, we did this thing called Bear Base. And we brought in gas turbines for our generators in the old days, yeah. <laughs> the old days. hey <laughs> gas turbines were uh, were the cream they were the best they were for the hot showers and the electric latrines and the <laughs> and the steak baking ovens so uh, that's well now we're talking the Air Force now uh, okay. uh, and no other questions for Melanie let's thank her again for a nice talk <laughs>